can't buy It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Um, some of the past interviews you can check out, founder of P90X, founder of RX Bar, founder of Atari. They talk about not just the ups, but the downs and the journey. Um, this interview is a little bit different. This is, was for the Process Breakdown podcast that I did. It was so good that I had to release it on Inspired Insider, so stay tuned. Um, and before you get to it, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. What we do is at Rise25, we help B2B businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 partnerships and clients, and we help you run your podcast so it generates ROI. And the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at a way to give to my best relationships, a podcast for me over, over the past 10 years has allowed me to profile others thought leadership in companies and give to them and have them on my podcast and platform. So if you have questions about podcasting, go to rise25.com. You can watch a video. My business partner and I banter like an old married couple. Check out rise25.com. Thanks. Listen to the episode. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, host of the Process Breakdown Podcast, where we talk about streamlining and scaling operations of your company, getting rid of bottlenecks and giving your staff everything they need to be successful at their job. You know, over the body of work, if you studied Bob Sutton, which you should, if you haven't, the body of work that he's put out gives exactly that, you know, exactly that. The staff, everything you need to be successful. Maybe not everything, but a lot of things, okay? Um, before I introduce Bob and give him the introduction, uh, the, the episode is brought to you by Sweet Process. And so if you've had team members ask you the same questions over and over, and it's the 10th time, well, there's probably a better solution or you haven't done a good enough job systemizing. Sweet Process is actually a software which makes it drop dead easy to train and onboard new staff and save time with existing staff. And Bob, when I was talking to Owen, the founder, uh, I knew universities use it, banks use it, hospitals, but I didn't realize that um, first responder government agencies use it in life or death situations. So you can use Sweet Process to document all the repetitive tasks that eat up your precious time. Huh. So you can focus on growing your team and empowering them. There's a 14-day free trial, no credit card required. Go to sweetprocess.com, sweet like candy, S-W-E-E-T process. Um, I'm excited for today's guest, um, Robert Sutton, officially, uh, goes by Bob, professor of management, science, and engineering at Stanford, where he co-founded the Stanford Technology Ventures Program and the Institute of Design, the official, the D school, right, Bob? The D school. And he studies leadership, organizational change, innovation, scaling. The D school, that's what we call it. Everybody calls it that. I love it. Uh, and, you know, his current project is the Friction Project. And he focuses on why companies make the right things too difficult, the wrong things too easy, and what to do about it. And he's published over... 200 articles in academic and popular outlets, seven books that have gotten accolades from top 100 business books to New York Times bestseller to Wall Street uh, Journal bestseller. Um, you should check out Hard Facts, Dangerous Half-Truths and Total Nonsense, nonsense. The, no the Knowing Doing Gap. You know, he says his neglected book, which everyone should go get because he released it after 9-11, so it didn't get the attention it deserves. Uh, weird Ideas That Work. I personally have loved the good boss, bad boss is my personal favorite out of them, Bob, and the no asshole rule and the no asshole survival guide, if that was enough, scaling up excellence. So, Bob, thank you for joining me. Great to be here. Great to talk to you, Jeremy. You know, there's so much going on in today's world and there's a lot to discuss with you, but I figure, figured we'd start with the friction project. And... You know, I mentioned why companies make the right things too difficult, the wrong things too easy, and what to do about it. So what do you, what does that mean? But so the way we got interested in this, and this is with my co-author, Huggy Rao, is in 2014, we published this book, Scaling Up Excellence. And that was about uh, two elements of scaling. One is how to spread good things across networks um, and organizations. And then the second one was how to grow organizations. So... So that, that was sort of the, the focus. But what we started realizing as uh, we started working with different organizations was as they got bigger and complex, 
things got harder and harder to do. So we got interested in sort of like your sponsor, I don't mean to plug your sponsor, but sort of like your sponsor, well, what can you do to make things better? And, uh, and, and then the other part we got interested in once we dug into this friction stuff is that there's actually a whole bunch of things that organizations should make harder, like unethical behavior, like launching products before they're ready that can hurt people, things mm. like that. So, uh, so and we've been kind of futzing around with this for four or five years doing case studies of, of Uber writing pieces. Um, and, um, and, and, and the main thing, the great thing about being a professor is like all these smart students so uh, we have our students doing case studies and in some cases working with organizations to reduce friction. So that's kind of the adventure we're on. So can you give me, an, uh, let's talk about an example for each. What's a, a couple of things that organizations should make harder and then maybe an example of, of one of the case studies? Well, uh, so an example of something that organizations should make harder is, is um, essentially throwing things into the marketplace before they're ready. And, and so there's a term in our book we call a cluster fug, since I guess I'm allowed to swear we call it <laughs> cluster fuck in other writings. So what happens when um, executives get excited about a new product or something like that, especially software executives who don't realize that hardware can't be fixed quite so easily, is that they throw it into the marketplace. So we call this a, a, a cluster fug. This is when people are impatient, they have an illusion it's going to be easy to do something when it's hard, and they're incompetent, which turns other people incompetent. So the definitive story in Silicon Valley is Google Glass, where uh, essentially Sergey Brin, the co-founder, he found, saw Google Glass in the labs, and, he, and, and, and all the people on the R&D team said, no, it's not ready, no, it's not ready, and he threw it out into the marketplace. And the... Glass, you know, the rest is sort of history, glass holes, all the worst product ever and so on. And so that's, that's the kind of thing that there needed to be a little bit more breaks. It, was, it wasn't ready. So that's, that's an example of, of things that are too, um, there needs to be a little bit more discipline. Um, and, and then, I, although for Google, it was, didn't cost them much money, it just hurt their reputation a little bit, at least by their standards. By the standards of a real startup, they'd be dead, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and then the other side is, is what ought to be easier um, as a headline if you want to if you want to um, think about one of the things that really causes problems and, and I bet that software that is your sponsor I bet you they get into some of this stuff are handoffs in organizations hmm. so so when you look what goes wrong in organizations that's where the problems are so one of the case studies we did and this is I can say this publicly was with JetBlue um, and it was with one of my heroes her name is is Bonnie Sinney, a uh, three-time Olympian in the Luge, still a pilot. She's now head of JetBlue Ventures. Um, and she led an effort. So what happened was when storms hit something like Kennedy Airport, they actually had terrible problems, especially in 2007, where the whole thing would shut down. They couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again very well. So what she did was she brought together people from all over the company, everything from pilots to luggage handlers, to reservation agents, and, and operations people too, and had them map, do a process map, which those of us who do efficiency stuff, we all do process maps, and to look to see what was necessary to close and then reopen Kennedy Airport. And there were all these handoffs from one thing to another, and what they worked on was fixing handoffs, and, and, and at least for um, five or six years afterwards, they improved the system quite a bit. But so I, so I, guess, I guess that's what I would say, impatience, is, 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 is when you're doing something that isn't quite done is dangerous, but uh, but when you want to make things that are hard to do that ought to be easy, the first place I look is handoffs, or one of the first places. Why do you like Bonnie so much? What do you respect about her? Oh, Bonnie's Bonnie's one of my. She's just one of my heroes. She's just done. She just can get shit done. I mean, that's what that's what she does. I mean, so. Uh, she was in a situation, she was not that senior person, and JetBlue had spent three or four years trying to fix this problem hmm. in kind of in an unauthorized way, kind of like a corporate rebel. Um, and she's a pilot. She knew it was actually dangerous and bad for the company to fly into Kennedy in some ways. She led the effort to actually fix it. And hmm. now she's head of JetBlue Ventures. Um, and um, it's just sort of like re remarkable what she does. And she's just one of those people who has always the courage to do the right thing and a lot of people who are that successful um, are actually quite arrogant. And I, so I, I first met Bonnie when she was in a Stanford class of 
time because she, she keeps wanting to come back to Stanford to get degrees because she loves education. And, uh, and so I had her in a team with, it was her and two undergraduates. And usually when you have somebody that accomplished, it's terrible. She was just so giving and, and so non-egotistical. Um, she's just a really constructive um, person. So I just admire her. Yeah, I love that. And then, so is this, do you have a roadmap for your next book? Bob, is this going to be part of the next book? <laughs> you know, so the people in your companies, it's like, you know, they have a roadmap. It's like, I just kind of talk to my co-author, uh, Huggy Rao, about three times a week. And we just keep, we keep having more and more. I've got like this document. It's just right on my hard disk here that 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 uh, that says sort of like running notes friction. I, I think it's like, and I've got a 90 uh, slide deck too. God knows yeah. what, the, but it's sort of like the way we describe it is we've taken like nine puzzles and shaken the pieces on the, on the table and we're trying to figure out how to, <laughs> how to build one puzzle that makes sense. So, so yeah, I got a lot of information. It just doesn't go together very well. And then and maybe we should talk about this with the advent of COVID, the question of fast and slow. Oh man, all these things that I thought were like impossible to do all of a sudden are happening really quickly. And then things that used to be easy, like going to a restaurant, <laughs> are, are, are difficult to do. So, so, so Huggy and I, were collecting uh, cases, and our students are doing case studies, and we're doing some research, and we're trying to figure out what we're learning from COVID. Yeah. It's, it's hard to untangle it. Well, I want to talk about what's happened faster with COVID, but because um, I have a um, suggestion for the working title of the book uh, from Good. listening to you. Um, <laughs> I don't know what the subtitle is, but frictionless is the, the title or something of the frictionless and then the subtitle oh, is something. Um, but but it, what, what I thought you were going to say about Bonnie is like, if you're an Olympian luge person, you need to create less friction. And so like, she's oh. almost the prototype, a person, yeah. not from a leader standpoint, but from her Olympic career standpoint, like literally that's what you have to do, right? If you're going to be successful at luge. Yeah. Yeah, so. yeah, well, and, 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 she, and, and she's like that. But also, Bonnie, in terms of friction, she has a sense of when to stop and when it's dangerous. She's a pilot and she's still alive. Yeah. And, um, and, and so she's pretty risk averse and she'll slow down, she'll cancel things. So, so yeah, yeah. So, she, so she knows when, when it's, it's fine to innovate and when it's dangerous. So yeah. that's the other thing I like about Bonnie. She, and, and that's one of the things that, like, Huggy and I are really into this notion of with organizations – of when you hit the gas and when you hit the brakes. Yeah, friction is good when you need to stop, it. right? I mean, friction, oh, oh, yeah, friction yeah. is a good thing. Then it's smashing your head at the end. Yeah. But um, frictionless, like luge to leadership. But um, that's my <laughs> – um, so, Bob, talk about what goes faster. What's going faster than expected with, you know, this friction project and with uh, COVID? Well, so the thing that's really striking, and, and a couple of my students are really getting into this, is, is one of the things that we're seeing are, um, and, and I have a colleague, Melissa Valentine, who studies these, is the rise of what some people call flash organizations or virtual pop-up organizations where, where just all of a sudden these organizations just pop up, they're completely virtual, and they just jam. And I'll, I'll give you uh, two quick examples. Yeah. One is called the United States Digital Response, which was, uh, which was founded by a bunch of folks who actually were in the CTO office of the Obama administration. And what they did, um, because uh, I'll be descriptive, our federal government's response was not being adequate. Um, what they did was they um, organized, it's essentially a matching, it's almost like a dating service. Uh, your, your readers can look up U.S. Digital Responses where governments ask for help, like the, the city, like, like New Jersey, the state of New Jersey would ask for help, rolling out unemployment benefits or something like that. Um, and, um, and, and then they called for volunteers. And now there's a couple thousand volunteers who are working for at least 150 municipalities and they finished a bunch of projects that are basically IT projects. And, and, and this is an organization that was just erected in, in, in like a week and boom, it was jamming. So that so how does that happen so fast? And you know how how slow government change occurs. And you you got things happening incredibly quickly. So that's one. And then my favorite one, and for your readers who are interested in the word faster speed, uh, and your listeners, they should look up a guy named Patrick Collision. Patrick Collision is CEO of a company called Stripe. But that's not the most interesting thing about him. The fact that he's a billionaire and started a company is not that interesting about him. Um, he's 
he's into doing things really fast. He's got a list of all these things that happened really quickly, like building the Empire State Building in a year and a half or something like that. Um, but what he did was he just got sick of the notion as an academic that it takes so long for us to get our research funded. So just for example, National Institutes of Health, which would be published, uh, supporting COVID research, traditionally, if you were an academic, you would spend a year just figuring out what to make the proposal and another year having the proposal reviewed and then you probably wouldn't get funded. That's, what, that's the usual fate of an academic. So, so what he did is he got some donations from various rich people like Reed Hoffman of LinkedIn fame. Mm. And he put out this call for proposals for COVID research and he said he'd re they'd be reviewed and um, rejected or funded in 48 hours. Mm. And this was, I think in, in uh, late March or early April, they, they put up the call for proposals. They got, um, I think it was 4,000 proposals and they just were really short. I actually tried to do one just to see how easy it was. It was like nothing. And, and, and then boom, they, they, I think they handed out $122 million to 40 projects and they're, they're kind of on pause. It was like, boom. Wow. And, and, and it was, and that was kind of, uh, some of that was, some of that was they want to do good. And some of that was Patrick Collision and other folks saying F you to the, to, uh, you know, how bad the process is and how friction filled it is. Mm -hmm. So, 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 so you know, the question that, you know, maybe we should talk about is, okay, so these are great stories, mm -hmm. but, but what are we learning about when we go back to real life about how to reduce friction? Cause you know, if we kind of go back to the Google Glass story, there's going to be more Google Glass stories because because that's the cost of of making things too easy to do. But it sure would be nice to get rid of all those processes that are just in the way and are just a waste of time. So that's the kind of stuff we're interested in. What What's another? What have you seen will be valuable for a company to apply once knowing that the um, well the Patrick collision. Well, 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 first of all, and this is every one of your listeners or um, audience knows this, what will happen in organizations is, is it's like these arbitrary traditions build up like barnacles and nobody ever scrapes them off. Yeah. So, so that's, that's something that Huggy and I always we call this addition sickness mm -hmm. and the notion, and sometimes we call this the George Carlin effect too, which is, and the way we describe it is so George Carlin, the, the famous late comedian, he had this, he had this notion that um, essentially the way that he put it is that um, my shit is stuff. So anything that I come up with is good and your <laughs> stuff is shit. So what happens in a lot of organizations is everybody adds all these little things because that's their pet peeve, that little practice, that little extra, they call it these robotic emails you get. I have to do these at Stanford all the time. I have to take 15 minutes. I have to sign on. I have to approve something that, that like, I don't even read, but I have to do it so the student can, you know, not get deported, for example, or something like that. And, 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 and my um, contribution is completely useless, but some bureaucrat decided that I had to do it. So, 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 so to me, that's one of the things yeah. that, um, that I, I think we will learn, at least I hope we will learn, is to get rid of some of these arbitrary traditions and 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 not just to say a la the a la of uh, sort of the George Carlin notion of 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 uh, you know th that um, it's other people's fault, but to sort of look in the mirror and realize that sometimes we're the gunk person who has this precious little thing we think everybody has to do, but really for the greater good it isn't. It can be worth skipped. It. it can be skipped. Yeah. It could be skipped. It could only be used in exceptional circumstances. It's, you know, I mean, one of the things, I know you've talked about this on your show, is there's all these organizations who have realized that the annual performance review uh, takes so much time, especially 360 degree evaluations, although in theory it's great, uh, that gee, maybe we don't have to spend so much time on this. And, and, uh, and, and we talk about this at least in, in some of our discussions, it was in Harvard Business Review too. We didn't write it, somebody else did. So Deloitte, they figured out with their 360 degree evaluation system, they were spending 2 million hours a year. Two wow. million, and those are hours they could build. They're like a consulting firm, right? Two wow. million hours a year, and, and, then, and then they streamlined it. So that's, that's some of the kind of, that sort of addition sickness. That's, that's kind of the stuff that, 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 that hopefully COVID will bring us to do what's going to make harder? Well, I we'll, what, we'll find out what should be harder later. So one of the things we're really into, in fact, we have a case on Uber, is, is this idea of debt, technical and organizational debt. Financial debt, obviously, is part of the story, too. But one of the things that organizations do 
is that they do a bunch of things that enable them to move fast for a while, but then the chickens come home to roost, the problems start appearing, and you end up with a whole bunch of things that are broken. And if you don't fix them, you can't scale to the next level or even survive. So the, the definitive one probably in technology would be uh, Mark Zuckerberg's Move Fast and Break Things. And I, I, I worked a little bit with uh, Facebook in the early days, up to about 400 people, and, they, and he really meant move fast and break things. And we talk about this in our book, Scaling Up Excellence. They would, they would socialize. But that was great until it wasn't. And everybody moved so fast and didn't think about users and legal issues so much. Now it's, it's kind of, you know, move fast and build good things. Or, <laughs> or, or I don't know what the last thing I heard was a, it, it, it was, it was move fast and build good things or stable infra or something like that. But they're, they're sort of modifying that. And maybe they should have modified that a couple of years earlier, honestly. You know, Bob, you said a few things. One um, is obviously, you know, maybe people at this point just need to stop, look at, reassess everything, review something, if it is halting or broken, and maybe look, look at eliminating things that basically are antiquated or are outliers, you know? Um, and then two, that annual performance review thing, that's just one example. I'm sure there's a lot of specific things that people do that you've proven in your research that are maybe should be done a different way. What should people do is, you know, is, you know, obviously you want to review people. What was proven? What did they show was a better method for something like that? Well, so, so I, I just, I'm enough of an academic. I worried about, about the words proven. So there's, there's kind of <laughs> two findings. One is uh, there's all sorts of evidence that the annual performance review sucks. Okay. Uh, yeah. it, it, it's biased. It spends all this time and everything. But there's a second um, question, which academics have not answered so well. So I would plead guilty to this which is, well, what's less bad? <laughs> right, How, what do you replace it with? <laughs> and, and one solution, and, and, and uh, some of your uh, listeners or audience may have heard this, is Adobe and then some other firms uh, got rid of the annual performance review, and, uh, and we did write a little case on this, and, and they switched to check-ins. So the idea was, is Donna Morris, who was then head of HR, she's now head of HR of Walmart, which is quite a big job, uh, just only done that a couple of months. And, and what Donna figured out was, uh, you know, th th that essentially every year around performance evaluation times at Adobe, that actually satisfaction of the company would go down because it just right. sucked. So, so she came up with a system they did called check-ins where you're supposed to have regular conversations with your boss, but there's no grand performance evaluation. And at least based on the data that they report, that seems to have worked because there's not that weird conversation with your boss where nobody quite knows what to do. So, so, so th there are some things you can get rid of, but, but that's why I always say it's one thing to complain about what sucks, but coming up with the something that's even yeah. better in life, uh, that's a lot harder. Because yeah. it's easy to say things suck, it's harder to fix them. Yeah, I mean, it makes me think of, you know, when people implement and do a daily stand-up with their meetings and a weekly stand-up, I mean, it's kind of equivalent, like don't just wait to the year, they're not, you yep. know, do a daily stand-up. I mean, that's what would be equivalent, right? Something like that. Yep, yeah, and, and, and some of that, well, the stand-ups are interesting because what you're kind of getting to there, that's another um, way to get rid of friction and coordination problems. And, and, and we talk about this, and I think we'll be writing about this more, is when you get people on similar rhythms, similar cadence, uh, that really helps. Uh, Salesforce, one of the great, in terms of these finances, one of the great success stories, that's a lot of what the key to their success is. It actually sort of saved the company when they're in trouble early on. They got their whole organization on sort of the same rhythms, the, the daily stand-ups. Uh, sort of shipping a demo every month. The whole company, it's, they still do this. They ship, they, they, they ship every four months. Everybody sort of pauses. And they have this thing called Dreamforce, where at least until this year, they took over San Francisco and turned it into a traffic nightmare. So, <laughs> so, but the rhythms really help glue the whole company together because you know what you're doing, when to do it, and you know also what everybody else is doing so you can coordinate with them. Yeah, well, it's kind of like what you talked about with JetBlue. One of the key elements is they brought everyone together. So you're getting these different perspectives of what needs to be done, right? 
Yeah, yeah. And, well, and what JetBlue was, that was a real specific case. Yeah. But, but the rhythms in the airline industry are different. The airline industry is a very difficult place to be right now. But yeah, but rhythms really do help. So, you know, Bob, talk about what was another favorite case study that's come out of this work, the Friction Project? Well, what's, what's, an, what's another? Um, fa- well, I, I talked about it a little bit, but it's worth talking about, and especially now, uh, the, the trouble that Uber and other, um, other industries are in, like the restaurant industry and so on, you don't know what's going to happen. But, but Uber was a really interesting case because um, in the early... In the early days, they, they essentially had one giant software system they called the spaghetti mess that was just, they had all these problems because the pieces didn't fit together. So then they went to this thing, they called it microservices, where they decentralized the organization. And as Tuan Pham, who was CTO until recently, who was the star of our case, described, we had um, essentially hundreds of speedboats going in hundreds of different directions. Yeah. Bless you. Um, and, 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 and so that's one of those things you had decentralization and, and, and you also had a culture under Travis where it was let builders build, toe stepping. It was almost like they rewarded people for not cooperating with each other. So that was great. So as Twan Pham put it, our average speed was really high. Our collective velocity was getting worse and worse because there'd be all these coordination problems. Just for example, they were using 12 or 13 different programming languages. Wow. So you couldn't weave things together. You couldn't move people from one team to another. And, and, and so, the, so what that does is it allows them to move fast. But then, and this is this issue of debt that we're really interested in, technological and organizational debt. It's, and and our, one of our general sayings is what got you here won't get you there, which we stole, of course, from somebody else. Um, but but there comes, this becomes this point, as I described with uh, Facebook, too, in terms of move fast and break things, where you have to stop. And you have to slow down. And as Twan Pham put it, we had to take all our speedboats and we kind of had to bring them. We didn't want to be a super tanker, but we wanted to be a fleet of larger boats that were all going in the same direction or ships. Yeah. So, so, so to me, that's one of the things that, we, that we're really interested in is, and from an organizational standpoint, that's centralization versus decentralization. So when do you kind of let everybody do what they want? And when do you sort of trim down stuff? So, I mean, right now with COVID is a good example You've got all these different, well, solutions in different municipalities. And, and, and some people complain about it, but it, it, it's also instructive because a whole, there's a whole bunch of experiments in the country about when do I open, how do I open. And, but, but, but the difficulty comes is when you start figuring out what works and what doesn't, <clears throat> and then, and then the, the, I don't know, either the lawyers or, 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 or just social norms I say, you've got to stop doing that because it doesn't work and you've got to do this instead. That's when you've got to let go of my stuff, which has been proven to be shit, and to <laughs> and to sort of, you know, join what actually works. So, so the, the sort of notion of the rhythms between centralization and decentralization, that's one of the things we're really interested in in terms of friction, which is that when do you let them go, and then when do you sort of weave everything together. Yeah, and there's probably a gray area where <clears throat> it's a tough call. Like uh, cer- certain parts are like obvious looking back, but at the time it's probably not so obvious, right? Ah, oh, yeah, well, in fact, that, that, that's the whole, well, so you bring up uh, another thing, which is really uh, something that every leader I know has a challenge, which is in general, when you're leading people through uncertain times when you don't know what's going on and they don't know what's going on, I mean, COVID's a perfect example, that saying to people um, that, that, um, that, that essentially we don't know what's going on, you've got to wait, that's a really difficult thing to do for <laughs> leaders. But, I mean, but, but sometimes you're finding out that, that they, they have to sort of delimit it, but, but they also have to say to the, to the people following them, sometimes we need more information. Right. We don't know what we're doing yet yeah. when it comes to this. Yeah, not just picking a path and go is like that's kind of a natural tendency of a leader to do, right? Yeah, yeah. So, and, 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 and so the poster, the poster child that I've been talking about, let me make sure I get his name right, who has, I think, been doing the best job of this mm. is the CEO of Airbnb. So mm. what, what's his name? How can I forget his name? Um, anyhow. I'll I know. His name yeah, I know you're talking about it. It's, it's slipping my. Anyhow. So what he's been doing is so so they did it they, they, they did a massive layoff this is remember the may 5th they did this this massive layoff 25 percent of the company and and so what he's brian and he chesky write, thank you brian yeah. chesky i couldn't forget that they 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 they, they, they do this um 
they, and, and he takes responsibility for it. But he also says, you know, here's all the things we're going to do for you. And they're doing amazing things. Just for example, they're taking a large proportion of their HR department and having it focused on helping find people who are laid off jobs. Mm. That, and, 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 which is sort of amazing. Um, but, um, but, but, um, but, but in addition, but, but I mean, in addition to, to that sort of thing, one of these things he said in the memo is that uh, there's a whole bunch of uncertainty and we don't, we don't believe in being transparent when we don't have enough information to make a decision and, and essentially to take you into the sausage making because I think that makes people even more stressed out. And the thing that I liked about that memo that he wrote is this amazing memo people can find online. He wrote it May 5th um, to the Airbnb folks is that he's saying, here's what we're certain about things like um, if you're laid off, you get your stock is vested and so on and you get this much money and you get to keep your laptop too, which I thought was pretty cool. But <laughs> here's the part that we're not sure about and we're not going to announce stuff until we're sure. And I, I really like that, that sort of conveying what's, certain and where we have doubt and we don't want to confuse you and make you even more upset. I thought that was sharing the thought step. process. Yes, but not too much. <laughs> not too much. You know, um, I'm curious what other companies you find fascinating with us. You said, you mentioned Airbnb, Uber, Facebook, Stripe. What, what other companies do you find fascinating? But, it's well, you know, it's, it, it might, it, it might not be very popular because they're, they're controversial, but I still am amazed by Walmart. Obviously, like you can talk about the damage they've done, and maybe we should, you know, maybe they should pay more. Well, that's why I use fascinating like because that could be construed whatever way someone wants, yeah, but, even if it's but, controversial. But if, I mean, they're the largest yeah. private employer in the United States. Um, they they really are for, uh, except possibly for Amazon, they're at least as much. They're the lifeline for holding people together in this process. Uh, they, they really are. Uh, you know, they, they could have better benefits. They really are taking care of their employees and really do care about their employees. So, so the way that they've responded to me is actually pretty interesting. So that's, that's, that's sort of like a, a, a and, and oh, I would say it's a non-tech company, but walmart.com is doing quite well. And, there, and some people think Amazon is worse in terms of how it treats its employees. So that's one of the others. Oh, I don't know what the, the facts are there. Um, that, um, the, the other company that also amazes me to sort of switch gears uh, is Netflix. And the reason they, they, they amaze me for lots of reasons. But so, uh, you know, uh, Clay Christensen and the famous, all the disruptive innovation stuff, the number of organizations that actually have successfully disrupted themselves is very small. And, and, and if, if you look at what they've done, they have disrupted themselves before the market did twice, not once. So, we all remember they used to ship DVDs, then it was streaming, and then they now they become I think the largest production company in the world. So so how did I mean that's those are really and they're still doing those other two things. Those are just brutal pivots, and and I don't know how they've actually pulled them off. And in fact, some folks will remember that they tried to spin off the DVD operation too early, and the market reacted negatively. One of the only organizations I've ever seen that may have disrupted themselves too early. Mm. Um, although they were right, because I mean, DVD is a shrinking market um, and, and a different sort of business model. So, uh, so anyway, so that's that's a, a company that really um, really impresses me. They, they also do weird things that fascinate me, and I'm not sure I'd want to work there, but but they're very performance driven. You talk about performance, boy, they really mean it when it comes to performance. Yeah, Bob, I want to talk about a couple of your books: um, Good Boss, Bad Boss, Weird Weird Ideas at Work. But I also want to go back to co-founding the Institute of Design, the D school. Uh, Talk about the inception uh, of that. Okay. So that's, I, I, so the way I would describe the founding story is it's sort of snow white and the seven dwarfs. And I was one of the dwarfs. Let's just be really <laughs> clear. Okay. So there's this guy named David Kelly who has won every award I can think of and deserves it. He just won a $500,000 award for teaching innovations from the National Academy of um, Engineering. Uh, and just a remarkable person. So David founded, and, and we started sending them in the 90s, a company called IDEO, which, which went from a mechanical engineering shop to doing broader sort of product design. And now what they do is that they help companies all over the world be innovative and almost no matter what they do. 
So he, so he led the spread of design thinking that way. David's also a tenured uh, Stanford professor. And, um, and, and he, he sort of, this is sort of 2003, 2004, uh, something like that. We used to go to IDEO, a group of us old professors. We'd go there, maybe like six o'clock at night, and he'd, he'd give us wine, we'd get kind of drunk and eat food, and he'd, he'd talk about bringing IDEO inside of Stanford. And we, you know, he's, it's really fun to drink with David. And, and somewhere on my hard disk, I've got Kelly's fantasy or Kelly's dream or something like that. Then one day he comes back with $35 million from this guy named Hassel Plattner, the founder of SAP. So we actually had to do it. And, and so, so what David, it, it, David did all sorts of things that I, he dis, I disagreed with, I may still disagree with. But one of the key things is in terms of a teaching operation, just for example, is, is that none of the classes we teach at the D school can be required for any Stanford major. And David's logic, and also he doesn't like paying people to teach in them very well, um, or sometimes nothing. If, it's, if I'm a tenure track faculty, he would never give me more money to teach a D school class because his perspective is that he wants everybody who is at the D school to be there because they want to be, not because they have to be. Yeah. And, and then our projects are all actually doing something. So, so my students, some students will build projects or, or, or yeah. products. Uh, my students in my management classes, uh, and this is where we learn stuff, they'll actually mess around with organizations and try to make them more efficient or more creative. I just, I did this one example because we wrote it up, is, uh, is that a couple of our students work with the San Francisco Opera and then it, it, it came up with these little events like in bars and stuff like that to attract younger people to opera music because if you've ever been to the opera, so I'm 66 years old, when I go to the opera, I can feel young. You know, it's like I look around. I'm one of the youngest people around. I go to the bathroom. I'm the only people who doesn't have a has a walker or is in a wheelchair. It's just, it's it's and 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 somebody from the San Francisco Opera sort of joked that our business model is we wait for a billionaire to die and leave us a bunch of money. That's like we lose money every year. A billionaire dies, boom. We might have that business model at Stanford too, by the way. It's they they give the money when we're alive, like Bill Gates and so on. But but um. But, but, you know, but, 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 um, but seriously, that's the kind of thing that, that is sort of fun to do at the D school is if you're not trying to actually have people come up with changing stuff, then you're not living the D school spirit and, and also consistent with that in addition to rapid prototyping and, uh, and trying uh, things that you can't, where you can't do too much damage and so on, that, that our, our other philosophy is to be very user centric, which has really taught me a lot that we're always in, into thinking about what is human experience and designing to make human experience better rather than worse. I mean, that is some of the fundamentals, most important things in general, I think, actually taking user feedback. <clears throat> uh, user feedback and, and just what, and the, and the other thing that, you know, we always say at the D school, and this is part of the ideal mantra, which David brought in, is, is that we don't just believe what people say, we watch them, you know, and then we try to have the same experiences ourselves. And, 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 and that's one of the classic sort of things. That's, that's how you learn is you try something yourself. So, you know, to go back to something that I just talked about about 15 minutes ago, that's one of the things that I thought was really interesting. And, and I think the D school taught me that with um, the fast grants thing that Patrick Collision set up, the best way to learn about it for in the past, I would have probably talked to somebody or maybe read about it. But I realized if I did it myself, I'd learn more because then I know what the experience, the experience is, is like, but yeah, yeah. that, I think that's, that's a mantra. And it sounds so obvious, but as you know, it's yeah. amazing how often people forget about, forget to do it. And Bob, when you say that, the question that pops in my head is to myself, how do you go wrong with user feedback? If people are going to be paying you money and you get their feedback on how to improve it, how do you go wrong with that? And then the devil on the shoulder <laughs> is like, well, Steve Jobs said, you know, well, if I asked what they wanted, I, they did ask for or, or Henry Ford, they get a, I give them a faster horse or Steve Jobs. Right, right. So talk about the, the difference of user feedback. Well, that's interesting. That's interesting. So, so th there's this argument that, that essentially you can't believe what people tell you because they'll do things that are socially desirable and they'll, and they'll do things that, um, that fit their past experience and they're uncomfortable. And it, it, you know, to your point, I think that uh, IBM did some sort of survey in the 80s that the worldwide market for or late 70s for PCs was like 2,000 PCs or something like that because the customers had these mainframes and they thought they were great. So that, 
So that's an argument that you come up with something that's different, and then you look to see whether people, how they react to it and how they use it. Yeah. And, 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 and so the, the old saying that my, what is it, my, my uh, mother said every day when I went to school, don't believe everything they tell you because you've got to actually see how people respond, respond in the situation. I, I'll give you another example since we're very interested in scaling to other markets. Yeah. Um, so IKEA, you may know, is very successful in China. And, 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 and you can read something about this, about them in um, Scaling Up Excellence, where we did not tell the whole story, okay. which was that when, and so many people may know that, um, that China has a do it for me culture, that it's not a do it yourself culture. So that's why Home Depot, for example, failed there, classic do it, do it yourself thing. So when, um, when Ikea opened in the Chinese market, uh, they, they, they made a couple of interesting um, sort of modifications. One, they had many more del better delivery and assembling services because not that many people have cars and they don't assemble their own stuff. Okay, so that was in theory. So this is my book. So I'm talking, this is about two years ago, I'm talking to 55 uh, Chinese CEOs. So they're from China. And in, in, in China, it's like, so tell me how big your average, and the supposedly startups, almost none of them had fewer than 500 people working for them. Wow. Uh, and, and I think it was one woman too, the, the gender dynamics were another issue. So anyways, so, so I start telling my IKEA story, but they're from China, I say, is this true? And, and, and then this guy says to me, um, in English, not through the translator, he said, so we don't assemble anything except IKEA. Mm. So what happened is IKEA sort of traded, so they were uncomfortable, and, and if you ask people, would you assemble something in China? No, but they go to the store, they have the experience, and then they do something simple and take it home. And to me, that's one of those cases where sometimes you don't learn until you put people in the position of actually doing it. In that case, they're actually, they're actually sort of like a Trojan horse for cultural change um, to, to sort of a do-it-yourself culture. Oh, in, in this case, I knew that they had actually done it because – one of the guys after, he said, uh, how, I said, how many had assembled stuff? Two thirds of them had assembled stuff. Wow. And one of them said, very bad for relationship <laughs> with spouse. So if you've ever, you know, we all know, we've ever done it. It's like, it's like, oh, so you know they've done it, right? It brings out the worst in people. <laughs> Just Manager, oh. Yeah. Well, it's so, interesting. You think, oh, based off all of that, Ikea would go and they would fail. Right? Yeah, you know, what? Yeah, but, but if you look at it, they were smart, which, which is that they, they both had more assembly. So, and they, they did, they changed a number, the, some of the food they changed for cultural accommodations. But, but what happened was they gave people the opportunity um, to learn. So anyway, so sort of, sort of an interesting um, combination of, well, we're going to conform to the culture, but we're going to sort of push it and see how far that they're going to go. And I, and I think that, and Apple's a great example of that all, all of us have iPhones and so on. They, 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 are, they, they do things like, well, they got rid of the, my earphone jack. I'm still annoyed by that, but I'm kind of used to it. You know, <laughs> I, I was kind of pissed when they got rid of the earphone jack, but, but it's one of those your elimination cool. thing. They go in and eliminate, they eliminate the disc drive. Then they eliminate the jack. Right, right, yeah. yeah, Exactly. So, so, but, 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 but to me, that's, that's a sort of, that, that, what, and, but then there's so many other good things they buy it, but, but, uh, but, and then well, they seem to eliminate the keyboard, that didn't work when they went to the butterfly keyboard. Now they're back to the old keyboards, but, but still, I think in some ways that notion that you're always sort of experimenting on the edge. And, and, and I, I remember there was this guy, Chris Bangle. So Chris Bangle was the head of design of BMW. And, and in fact, I got him to endorse Great ideas that work when he was head of design of, of uh, BMW because I met him somewhere at a conference. And he had this great line, which this kind of reminds me of, which is that when we come up with a new uh, line, you know, you know, an update like 3 Series BMW or whatever, our goal is to lose about 15 or 20% of our existing customers. Hmm. Because if every one of our existing company customers likes what like we're doing, he said, you end up with the Oldsmobile. Like, like every, every year, like your customers die, essentially. So, so what you've got to do is you've got you to have that sort of tension between comfort and discomfort and, and, and make your existing folks, who, you know, uncomfortable enough like my ear jack. I still bought the phone. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, but make them uncomfortable enough that you sort of lose a few, but then you bring even more and then you keep innovating in the culture too. So it kind of, it kind of reminds you of that, that tension between, uh, making people uncomfortable, but not too uncomfortable. Yeah. Well, thanks for telling that story. That's <clears throat> about the inception of the D school, but, um, 
on that note, weird ideas that work. What's one of your favorite stories from, from the book? Uh, well, so weird ideas that work, the general premise of the book is, is that I started out with, which actually a pretty mundane and well-established idea in the behavioral sciences, that the logic of doing innovative work and routine work are different. That, that, um, that, that essentially, and you think about it, if you're doing innovation, you're failing all the time, you actually want to have a bunch of functional conflict over it. Uh, you're looking at the same thing as everybody else and things, seeing things differently. It's, it's, it's a different logic. And, that, and then when you're in routine work, well, you don't want to have a lot of failure when you have a routine surgical procedure. You don't want the physician to pretend that, I don't know, that your kidneys are your heart, which is the kind of thing that an innovator would do. Um, and, um, and, and you don't want to have a lot of arguing about how your um, surgical procedure should go because that would be a bad sign. So, so I sort of did that, and, I, and then I sort of took things a little bit um, – Further, so just just for example, one of the weird ideas I have is reward success and failure, but punish in action. Okay, mm. um, and you know, I don't even know that I agree with that at all times. But <laughs> but if you think about the logic of innovation, um, that that you do want to have people who are constantly experimenting and trying things, and the other part, which I hope we put in, I put in the book, but I honestly can't remember to quote my buddy Diego Rodriguez, who's head of innovation at Intuit and was an IDEO for years, uh, he likes to ask clients in the old IDEO place, uh, where's your place for failing? There's some places where it's safe to fail and there's some places where it's not safe to fail. And maybe the best story in that book, by the way, there's lots of stories, um, but so there, there's, there's a guy, a famous guy um, named Mitch Kapoor. Mitch Kapoor was founder of Lotus, was kind of an accidental billionaire, a, still a venture capitalist, fascinating guy. So Mitch Kapoor, this is like in the 80s, he comes up with this, Lotus was essentially a spreadsheet. And, and, uh, and it's sort of like a bunch of his hippie friends started this organization. And he looks around like five years later, and he's chairman of the board of a company that has 5,000 um, employees. The CEO's from McKinsey. There's all these people in suits, and he's an old hippie. And, and then, so what he does is he works with his actually uh, then head of organizational development and now wife. I don't think this is irrelevant, Frida Klein. Um, now Frida Kapoor, I believe. And what they did was they took the um, resumes for the 40 people who started the company, including Mitch's, although they disguise his a little bit, and they put them into the HR system, and none of them even got a call back, <laughs> including Mitch. And so you think about that. So you have to create hand, the organization you won't be hired at, right? Yeah, yes. Isn't that great? Uh, and, and I have two, and, and there's a bunch of stuff about how, in, in the book, the tone was I was taking Mitch and Frida's perspective. This is outrageous. This is why they weren't innovative enough. But then, you know, I started, started thinking, well, for the culture of innovation, that might make sense. But to really cash in, maybe those were the wrong 40 people. And I actually don't know the answer to that. But you can sort of see the, the difference in logic you know, bet- between founders and people who do well in an organization that's just, you know, cranking out selling the, the, the Lotus um, software. So, well, so your so example me, with Facebook also. I mean, their first motto is break things, right? And now it has to change a little bit. And now, oh yeah, and, and and the other thing you look at Facebook, boy, Mark's there, but uh, just about everybody else is is gone. And we'll see how much longer Sheryl Sandberg lasts. But but everybody who who sort of helped found and grew the company, or almost everybody, they've really replaced most of them. So that's another example that the the people who were right early on, Mark's clearly changed, but uh, but uh, they definitely were not right. And one of my favorite people who I worked with him some, Chris Cox. He was employee number thirty. Did newsfeed. He was, he was actually head of HR for a while when, when Mark didn't like traditional heads of HR, even though he had no HR experience. He actually did a great job. And then he was head of product. And eventually it got to the point where, well, I don't know why he left, but I suspect he wasn't right for the company anymore. It wasn't right for him. So, Bob, I have one last question. I know we're pressed on time. Um, where should we point people towards first to find out more about you and about the books <clears throat> and about everything else you have going on? Well, probably the best place, just go to my website, bobsutton.net. So that's where my books and, 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 uh, and various things are there. And uh, that's, that's probably the, the best place. Um, or they can just, you know, Google me because you can find stuff like that so easily. But bobsutton.net is probably the best Bob place. Bobsutton.net, you can go on Amazon, check out their books. Um, Audible, check out their books, all those places. I highly suggest it. Um, so, Bob, last question is... Um, 
you know, out of all your, your body of work, I wanted to hear maybe from one of the other books we didn't touch upon and a favorite story. It could be from the no asshole rule, good boss, bad boss, what company or case story or research um, should we tell? Oh, uh, well, that, well, that's, that's interesting. So, so I guess my favorite choice, I haven't thought about this story in years. So, so the no asshole rule, which, you know, we haven't talked about it, which is probably just as well, but the no asshole rule for better or worse is sold more than all my other books combined, maybe by a factor of three. It's getting close to a million copies wow. worldwide. And, and, and there was sort of a prophetic moment when, and I didn't realize this, I was 21 years old and I was with my then girlfriend, now wife, Marina, we went to a restaurant called Little Joe's. And Little Joe's was this wonderful Italian restaurant with a long counter. And, 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 the, and the, the chef, he, he- Where was it? In San Francisco. San Francisco. In, 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 uh, in sort of on Broadway Street. And, and just really entertaining. And, and there's mostly people sitting at the counter and bantering. And there was this one guy who kept insulting the chef. He was inappropriately hitting on women. And he was being an asshole. And so- so this guy runs up to him and he, and he says, so one of the other guests, and he said, you're just so wonderful. You're one of the most wonderful, fantastic people I've ever met. I've got to get to know you more. Please give me an name. There's a big performance of the whole thing. And, and, and the guy who was the, the asshole gives him his name and everything. And then he announces to the whole restaurant, he said, I'm writing a book on assholes and you are perfect for chapter 13. <laughs> and then the whole place, you just like this, this like operatic, they sort of cracked up. And little did I know at that point, I don't know, 20 some years later, I'd be writing a book on assholes <laughs> and I got this guy in my last chapter. So, so, so whoever that stranger was who got the, the mess, the uh, story from the asshole, he was actually providing material for my work and I didn't even know it because I never occurred to me write a book on assholes. So, so that might be my favorite. I haven't thought of that in, in a few years, even though it's in the book. Why that title? Oh, why? Because it would, because I think it was commercially the best title. I, honestly, if I called the no jerk rule, I think it would have sold 2000 copies. So, uh, so that's, you know, and, and, and the fact that it was controversial, honestly attracted attention to it. So that, you know, and if you sort of fast forward, it's a relatively clean and innocent title. I even noticed, so I, I, I was quoted in an article in the New York Times about Michael Jordan just a couple weeks ago, because, um, you know, there's this series about him and him the being an asshole, days. and yep. there's all this, argue, all this argument, of, did it help him get ahead and everything? And I noticed the New York Times, which when I was in the bestseller list, they wouldn't even give me the A, it was the no seven star rule, that mm -hmm. they printed the word asshole two or three times in the story. So even the New York Times is coming around. So it's either... They're, they're reflecting reality or it's a degeneration of values depending on what you believe. So, First of all, Bob, I want to thank you. Um, everyone check out bobsutton.net. Check out um, Amazon, Audible. And uh, thank you so much, Bob. It's, it's really fun to talk to you. Thanks so much, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same right now. I feel like a hundred grand